Um, next up, we have the Royal College of Art and the Animal Diplomacy Bureau. Multi-species cities can live in harmony, it turns out. Join me in welcoming RCA. Hi everyone, I'm Kayleen. I'm from the Royal College of Art. I recently just graduated with an MA in Design Products. And today I'd like to talk to you about the Animal Diplomacy Bureau. The Bureau's mission is to cultivate better human-animal relations through changing the way we think. Because it really matters what thoughts think thoughts and we really need to change the way we think if we want to move towards a more environmentally stable future. And that starts with leaving behind this idea of a really human-centered world. If you look at our cities now and how we plan them, you can see animals really are not represented within them. They're not part of our world that we have created. We need to be moving towards a multi-species world where we are embracing and thinking about different animals and what they need and how we can accommodate them if we want to be moving toward changing the way we're going in the future. For this particular project, I'm focusing on birds because they are the wild animals that we see every day on a daily basis yet we don't really have much relationship with them, even though we do see them every day. This project is a lot about translating realities. How do we translate bird reality into a way that we as humans can understand and find relevance to? To do that, I went and talked to quite a few people, and this included people who were really passionate birders and volunteers, like Gahan and Graham, who taught me a lot about the local birds in London, where they live, why they're living there, to Professor Rose Thorogood, who taught me how do birds really use all that information that they get in their environment, how do they use it, how do they make decisions. And I found out some interesting things. In London, some species are doing really great, some are doing really badly. Um, one example is a native species, which is the house sparrow. Um, they are endangered in the UK. And a lot of scientists don't really know quite exactly why that is, but it's a likely culprit of is a compound of human factors like changing architecture, um, changing vegetation, planting practices. Another uh, and the invasive species that is taking over London at the moment is doing fantastic is the ring-necked parakeets. And there's a lot of ideas about where they came from, mostly from the pet trade. But one story I'll share with you is that Jimi Hendrix released them in Carnaby Street. I'm not really sure if that's true, but that is something that's happened and people are releasing birds and they are coming back um, and they're expanding outwards. So they're doing very well. But how are they infecting our native species? What I want to highlight is that both these species, whether they're doing good or bad, um, they're doing what they're, what's happening is that our human impacts, are, we are impacting them as humans. And to get people to start thinking about these issues in relation to themselves, I started, I, create a mixed reality game that lets people transform themselves into birds so that they can experience um, bird life in the city. Birds on the street is focusing on house sparrows played on streets and grass. Birds on the grass is played um, in the parks because parakeets like to wander in London parks, that's their home. Both these games are pervasive games. They're games that incorporate physical locations within gameplay, which is incredibly important because birds are location specific. Players are playing these games in places where birds are living or have lived before. And just to give you a brief idea of how that works, um, Birds on the Street, again, about house sparrows, is a cooperative game. You can be a house sparrow parent, you can be a chick, or you can be a peregrine falcon. But the house sparrow parents, their goal is to raise their chicks in the city. So they've got to find three pieces of food, which I planted throughout the park, and they had to find them within seven minutes, or else the chick dies off one by one each round. They have to avoid the falcon because they will take them out of the game. In contrast, birds on the grass is about competition. It's about invasive species. So you can be on the team of the ringneck parakeets, on the team of the great tits, which are a native species, or the peregrine falcon. So parakeets and great tits are released into a park. And again, they have to go find food. The peregrine falcon will be roaming and hunting them. And if they catch them, all the points are the peregrine falcons. So at the end, there's a clear victor, whoever has the most food points. Each of the games are played with a flat pack bird hat, which is really easy to transfer. And say hi to my birds. <laughs> and each, um, each bird hat has a helmet liner and a cell phone, which you'll see really briefly. Oh, yeah. 
And that's really important. That cell phone's really important because that technology enables me to give my birds bird senses. Thank you, birds. <laughs> So the two senses they have are the bird alert network. So when the predator and the prey are close by in range, uh, they'll hear bird alarm calls. So that's a peregrine alarm call. And you might also hear a parakeet alarm call. And this is what the birds, uh, the players are hearing. And I teach them how to understand bird calls and what they mean, because all bird calls really do have meaning in them. The second uh, sense they have is the bird song compass. So I'm using a locative audio app that lets me put sound in different locations on a map. And what that means is, for example, if my house sparrow has wandered from the street into Thurlow Square Garden here, it'll hear this, which is a flock of feeding sparrows. And that indicates that there's food in that location. And this is how my players are navigating the city and the play area that I've designated. I played this game with, um, for 27 different players and five full runs. So it's evolved quite well over the time, and it's been smoothed out. And I'd like to share with you a clip of Birds on the Grass, and it's followed uh, by in a few short interviews. Lesson one, bird sound compass. Players find food by listening to other birds. As they walk around, they will hear geocached parakeet calls, indicating that food is nearby. Lesson two, bird alert network. When the parakeets, or great tits, are close to the falcon, all birds will hear an alarm call. It's then up to the birds to strategize. Lesson 3. Hunting. In this game, the falcon hunts parakeets and great tits. When the falcon catches them, he gets all the food points. Lesson 4. Mobbing. Birds can protect themselves from the peregrine by ganging up. With training over, birds are released into the park in search of food. Here we are following a great tit. It's heard the parakeet calls and knows that food is nearby. With food in hand, suddenly the alarm network activates. The great tit has spotted the peregrine. It attempts a quick escape, but failure. The great tit has been captured. He has to hand over the food he has found to the peregrine falcon. The successful peregrine now looks for his next targets. He adopts a sit and wait strategy, hiding behind a tree. The peregrine swoops in, but no success. The birds are mobbing him, a common bird technique. Birds gather together to scare away predators in a bid for survival. Better luck next time, Falcon. Successfully escaping danger, the birds now make their way to the final destination. The game ends. The food points are tallied. Let's see who won. The invasive species, the parakeet, has won this round. The great tits were far behind. It's difficult to compete with a species as clever and relentless as parakeets. People de-bird, become humans, and gather together for a discussion. As we return to human realities, a discussion about birds in the city begins. I had to be quite sneaky. To hide quite well. I got to move as a bird and think as a bird. I found it interesting to be an invasive species. I felt a bit more aggressive than I would in normal life. Um, which is kind of weird. Because you're in this, I think you've really put yourself in the situation and you kind of do feel like a bird in a way. I was thinking about um, other birds around me, as, such as prey. I was thinking about how to avoid predators. Really got into character. I was flying around, flapping. Yeah, so. It definitely made me think about the birds and the environment and how they interact with each other because I was doing it. So as you can see from some of the interviews that I shared with you, people really began to form a really empathetic bond towards the animals. I'm starting to bridge that relationship and create a relationship where there was none before. I give people bird knowledge that's accurate and I give an ability to experience something and make that their own personal experience that they can think about later in life. And these are all good things because that lets me get people ready for a multi-species world. And at the end of each of these games, it's a really rich discussion. Um, and at these discussions, I'm able to ask people and direct them towards this question, which is, what if we designed cities for both humans and animals? What would that look like? And in collaboration with an illustrator, I created this, these cityscapes based on the feedbacks from each different game. This particular one is Zoning City. 
This one is Birdwatch City, which is imagining a city that really loves watching birds. And as a result, their public infrastructure is circulating around bird watching and bird listening. This is Wetland City, which imagines what if we gave up some of our own land in exchange for some more bird land. I'm hoping that through these games that people can begin to start having a dialogue about coexistence and about multi-species futures. Thank you. All right, critic panel, which one of you would like to start this time? I want to give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Wow, this is, this is profound. You have me thinking <laughs> about, I mean, we, we often look at how we can use technology and this is a different kind of role playing, certainly, using technology to help us appreciate and be sensitive to, to um, other species. Wow, this is amazing. Thank you. Um, I, it, um, certainly this, this game that you're playing is, is um, part of generating awareness. And the, the, it's what happens after that that you're trying to achieve, I think, as a result of that awareness. And what do you see as the next steps? Uh, certainly you've shown some of the artist, artist concepts, but what would you see as the next steps once you've generated this sensitivity? Uh, the next, after playing the game, you mean? Yes. Oh, yeah. So the next steps is really get more people thinking about multi-species futures. The challenge in this project really is how do you get people to start talking about animals again? How do you start making that part of their world? And I think for me the next step in this is to expand it, scale it up, see if I can get more people to play, uh, different people, different pe walks of lives, different animals, and start to spread this kind of thinking. Because what I'm really doing is creating that bridge that allows you to go to the next step. And I'm not defining where that next step is for each individual. It's something for people to think about and process. It's totally their own thinking, yeah. Where do you see this impacting decision makers, for example, that okay. can make a difference in, in terms of reconfiguring our cities and designing our cities? I would really like to get a group of professionals, such as architects, uh, to play this game, because they'll have really incredible insights about how architecture works in terms of humans, but what about animals? And so. One of the directions this could possibly go is sort of a professional development section where I go out and offer these games as part of a, mm -hmm. I don't know, employee training almost, mm -hmm. and start to just get people to think differently. And that, that would be quite impactful if I was able to be able to do this with a group of professionals from a specific um, area, or even a mix would be really nice. Mm -hmm. So um, it, it really wonderful idea. Um, I'm thinking about alternative ways of doing a similar kind of thing um, in, in ways that would be something that, that individuals could do after the game. And, um, and then, I, then I reminded myself, oh wow, Pokemon Go has been like this phenomenon, right? Where you have something akin to what you're, you've done, but done at a sort of a grand scale where people are playing it in like, ridiculous amounts. And I was wondering, have you, have you thought about doing something beyond what you've got here and sort of mixing in sort of like, like a, you know, some other mobile form factor that I could take home and might be as fun as Pokemon Go? I mean, imagine if instead of chasing Pokemon, you're actually interacting with things that, that really matter. Yeah, so the version that I showed you, I would call my festival version that would be touring, but I feel like I really want to make a take home version. Um, and this could involve the tricky thing is the technology portion about how do you get it so that it can go on people's phones. But I think I think I could easily make a take-home version. Um, but as to how to scale it and for what age range is quite a good question. A lot of people have come up to me and said, you should do this for kids' parties, which would be quite fun. Um, but I think it's quite easy because the hats themselves are very easy to make. They can be, the original ones were made out of paper, so it's just a matter of scaling it down to a form that people can take home and play with their friends, yeah. Beautiful, purposeful, and impactful idea, I think, congratulations. Um, I'm just like curious about, um, I, I personally, zoos and circus environments are where animals are kind of the actors, and sometimes it's very, um, annoying and touching people, sometimes emotionally bringing some ideas, but since you have a very impactful idea, are, are you planning any 
much um, any provocative, maybe speculative environments that you may bring this as a performance, like such mm. as replacing an act that is designed for something for fun, replace with this beautiful idea. Do you have any plans, like much quick, impactful, speculative performances in the near future? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand. Do you mean um, platforms where I can play the project? Yes. Or, oh, I'm hoping to be showing at London Design Festival, but that's still not not sure yet. Yeah, yeah. I'm ho I'm looking for platforms to do this because wow. I do have a full set of bird hats that are ready to play tonight. <laughs> if you guys would like to join, yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That might be the best way to end. Everyone's now thinking, I'm going to get to the party really fast so I get a bird hat. <laughs> Thank you very, very much. Thank Wonderful. You.